Welcome, readers, listeners, and viewers from across America and around the world. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets of Build here on Truth Frequency Radio. I thank all of you for taking the time to be with us this evening. I'm honored to have as guest with me, Joe Taylor. Joe, are you there, brother? I'm here. Excellent. Um, well, thanks. It's been a long time coming. I know we've been trying to get together for a while now, um, but I wanted to give you a chance before we go into the interview to share if you have website or contact information, Facebook, YouTube, anything of that nature. Yeah, you can get the uh, Mount Blanco website at uh, mtblanco.com, mountblanco.com. And uh, <clears throat> you can uh, email us at mountblanco1 at aol.com. And that's that. And they'll, that'll get to me either way. Okay, great. Um, well, can you also tell people about your museum? And also kind of, because you said you do five occupations and you're busy um doing a number of different things so kind of introduce people to your work and your efforts and you know the kind of things that you focus on especially with the museum probably uh, uh my varied interests have all come together to uh make the the mount blanco fossil museum work we're as far as we know <clears throat> the largest non-evolution working fossil museum in the country, if not in the world. And by working, I mean, we do everything from dig it up, uh, we restore it, mold it, mount it, <clears throat> do research on it. And uh, the, the entire thing would do art that goes along with it. Anything that's required <clears throat> interface with other paleontologists, whether secular unbelievers or, or Christian creationists. Uh, the museum <clears throat> is not a lot of uh, fancy skeletons, which that's great. You know, a T-Rex skeleton's great. But <laughs> if, they don't, if they don't tell you anything about a T-Rex, for instance, uh, <clears throat> uh, if they don't tell you what's th that it was found with things it shouldn't be found with, <clears throat> like uh, T-Rex we were digging up there in, in uh, Montana, it had uh, <clears throat> several other dinosaurs with it, but it also had crocodile or turtles, crocodiles, and three kinds of plants, three different preservations of plants, and <clears throat> 18 broken T-Rex teeth so far, but no T-Rex. So there's a story there. We're not sure what the meaning of it is, but a friend of mine dug up another T-Rex up, I believe, in uh, Montana somewhere. <clears throat> the, the most insignificant thing was a little movie they showed at the end of the presentation when you went to see the thing. It was a little movie to show. At the end, it listed all the plants that were found with it. And here's a T-Rex. It's a land animal, right? So there's Equicetum, which is giant uh, ferns, big 60 to 90 feet tall, not like that today. Wow. wow. There's figs and uh, willow. Well, those things don't grow together. They they were all, you know, when you get those, those ecologies mixed is if you have a tornadic wind or a violent rushing mud and water. And that's what you find all over Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Colorado, Texas, you, you name it. What you find are, the, in some cases, uh, 10,000 animals of, of dinosaurs of one species buried. And they had to be buried alive in a giant mud flow. <clears throat> and that thing just goes on forever. There's a dig my friend is doing up in uh, Lemon, South Dakota. The fossil layer that there is uh, three feet thick and it stretches for I don't know how far, blocks and blocks, maybe miles. I discovered one in Colorado that I call the half mile site. And it there was a layer of rock three feet thick that had been roached up on, the, on its side. That it was like cement. One third of it was bone and the rest of it was, was rocks. I mean, it's uh, cement. And it went on for a half mile till I ran into federal land and I quit looking because I don't, I don't search on federal land. Uh -huh. um, so what what you that tells you a lot that's not just a dinosaur somewhere in that three that one that a uh, half mile site 
there were also crocodiles and uh, land animals and, uh, and fish. So they don't live together. They all had to be mixed together. And sometimes you find skin on these things still preserved. <clears throat> wow. It begs the question of how in the world they, they get there. That, that couldn't be a normal occurrence. Like they die and after a while, hundreds of years later, they finally get covered up. That, that just doesn't fit. <clears throat> and having been in all those states, and really in most of the states across the United States, up and down and across, <clears throat> I can tell you that's pretty much the way it is. It's mass burials from one end of the country to the other. And that goes all the way around the world. Same way when I was in uh, uh, Israel last year, same thing. Uh, and then the reason we even see fossils now <clears throat> is because the abatement, there were two things that happened. The, the flood, which is a complex thing. Then the abatement, when all that water ran back in the ocean, people forget that part. That cut the canyons of Quran, uh, uh, canyons in, in North America, uh, all over Africa, uh, you name any country that has canyons in it, where you see the strata laid out, like, a, like in Arizona, the Grand Canyon area, you see flat layer upon flat layer, and they stretch for miles on end. There's no way that could be a river that got out of its banks. That's not some local creek flooding. You know, that's worldwide. And anybody, any paleontologist that doesn't know that, any geologist that doesn't admit that, is uh, trying to keep his job. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, of course. Uh, and so you're saying that the mix of the even T-Rex and the ferns and crocodiles and all of these creatures that that could have only been um, the cataclysm of Noah's flood and that mixed all those things together and and if that is the case, then you're saying that dinosaurs are not millions or billions of years old, but that had to been uh, around during the time of this cataclysm. Is that? That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. <clears throat> mm, very and interesting. In fact, if th that really proves the story of the flood is true, you know, uh -huh. talk about it well. What about the ark? You know, could all those, could somebody build a building like that? Well, it, they had a, a long time. These men were superior to us, not only in brain power, but in physical power. Right. Yeah, in a hundred years, you can build a lot. So and they lived a thousand years or near right. almost. So that's right. The time we learn something, we all become senile. <laughs> you know, right. that, that play with them. So, okay, you've got the boat. That's believable. What about all the animals on there? That's not hard if everything gets on as a juvenile, especially uh, uh, dinosaurs. Most dinosaurs hatch from, the biggest dinosaurs we know <clears throat> about, hatch from eggs about the size of a stretched out uh, basketball, uh, an egg about a foot long, and they come out the size of a kitty cat. So being lizards, most of them, uh, they wean at an early age, <clears throat> therefore, they're ready to get on the ark when they're only a couple of feet tall. They've got the longest lifespan ahead of them. There's no mating. There's no fighting. They don't eat very much or do anything else much. They just sleep. So, okay, it's it's not hard to get all the animals of, of every kind on the ark. Well, then what about after the ark? How come we don't see dinosaurs today? Who says we don't see them today? Uh-huh. I've got a... <clears throat> I've got a, 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 a couple of interviews with a, a friend of mine uh, in a nearby town who lived in Crosbyton uh, for a while. And he wanted to tell me about this thing he saw flying in the air. And uh, what he saw, I, had, I said, well, can you, can, you do, can you draw that for me? He drew a pterodactyl. Uh -huh. And it was not something he was trying to convince me of, that he saw it. He was trying to convince me that, hey, you know, it flew on down there in the canyon. It's down there. We could probably go find it. Okay. Uh -huh. Did dinosaurs get on the ark? Yes. Did they get off the ark? Yes. Well, where are they now? Well, uh, believe it or not, the earth ain't getting warmer. <clears throat> Maybe it warms up in a few spots here and there, melts all those glaciers and turns it back into farmland. That'd be nice. <laughs> the earth has gotten, uh, the, the, 
the tropical belt used to be pretty much worldwide. And it's shrunk down now to <clears throat> the, you know, the tropics in Africa and, and the Amazon jungle. Well, nobody even knows what's in those places. Even the natives don't know what's in there totally. Uh, they're surprised every now and, now and then by things. So you can't say, you know, just because you can't see something doesn't mean uh, it doesn't exist. It's like these PhD guys that can't see God. Well, I can't see your brain, pal. <laughs> You've got a brain, so shut up. <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> I have an interview with um, an Amazonian lady who married to this uh, red-headed white guy from Tennessee. They're missionaries. And she was telling me about, uh, she was trying to get a book on dinosaurs. And <clears throat> I didn't really have anything she needed. But she, she said, well, you know, my dad killed something, and we want to show him you know, some pictures, have you pick up which one it was. Well, apparently he killed an Allosaur or a T-Rex. And I think the color she said was black. It's in the Amazon jungle. He shot it accidentally when he was, you know, was going to kill a pig. And as soon as the arrow let go, this T-Rex-like thing, whatever, reached out and grabbed the pig in its mouth. And the arrow hit the, uh, the, the T-Rex or whatever it was. Probably in its ear, went right into the brain, maybe the brain stem or something, and killed it. Wow. So <clears throat> uh, the natives all started complaining. They came to this guy and said, man, why does the jungle smell so bad? So he told them, well, they went back there, and here's this big dead T-Rex looking thing laying there with a pig in his mouth. You can imagine the smell. <clears throat> so it was her uncle or the, or the, the dad. He was said he was out. <clears throat> oh, there's this uh, other big monster. It's got a fat body, a long neck, and a long tail. And it's also black, about eight or ten feet tall. And so we uh, we make sure we never get within 100, 100 feet of that thing. Well, why is that? They don't exist. They've been dead for 141 million years, give or take four or five days. <laughs> well, you know, maybe, they, maybe yours are, but ours aren't because... He said when that thing makes a bark, some sort of a sound it can emit, and said it 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 you're paralyzed for a few minutes or a little bit, and the thing comes over and grabs you. Wow. Yeah. Well, no, wait a minute. You know these are they've been extinct for millions of years. And besides that, they're herbivores, not carnivores. They wouldn't eat a person. Uh -huh. Well, you know, uh, I had some sheep one time. <clears throat> Those things. I would have thought they would never have even gotten near pork, especially spoiled pork. Some friends came and left some pork. It went bad. I fed it to the cats. The sheep beat them to it. Okay, that's weird. So, yeah, that's weird. So could an herbivore dinosaur eat a man? I, I'm not going to say no. Did you know horses will eat live chickens? Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Wow. This, uh, two people have told me this one goes, yeah. We've got to keep our, I think it was a, an Arab, uh, an Arabian horses. We've got to keep them away from the chickens because they'll stomp up to death and eat them. Go, what? Interesting. So, you know, all this stuff, we, we see T-Rexes with those big, long teeth. We go, oh, they evolved those to eat meat. Well, not necessarily. There's this new fruit I saw over here at a grocery store the other day. It looks like something out of Jurassic Park. It's got like little pins all over it, kind of bumps, weird looking thing. And apparently it tastes real good, tastes like chicken, but it smells real bad. Well, what a perfect thing for a T-Rex steak. You know, it's three of those, he's, he's full. So, you know, the Bible says that God created all everything to eat herbs. Right. Okay, why do, uh, why does, why do a lot of things eat meat? You know, well, us too. We don't have carnivorous teeth. Uh -huh. We have vegetable teeth, but we eat meat, right? Right. Well, thanks to Adam's fall, and people don't believe this either, but <clears throat> the reason we have sin in the world, the reason there's death and all that stuff is because Adam disobeyed God. Yeah. And as the Bible says, in Adam, we all die. Uh -huh, right. Everybody's born dead. Unless you're born again, you're, you're dead in trespasses and sins. And yeah. when that happened, apparently that, that went into the whole world, and certain animals like T-Rex, tigers, and other things, started eating each other, eating meat. And uh, and then those teeth don't necessarily mean anything either because there are, there are camels, uh, deer, and rhinoceros that have uh, teeth like saber-toothed cats. And they just eat vegetables. They eat leaves. So 
sharp teeth don't necessarily mean anything. That's a lot of stuff the the evolutionists who have had free reign with fossils for 150 years. You know, some of it was, it was uh, you know, they made stuff up because that's what it looked like. Uh, but some of it's based on assumptions. If they just stuck with the Bible, you know, things would be much more easily explained. Right, right. Um, you know, there's, um, I believe it's, the book of Jubilees or Jasher in one of those texts and also in the Aramaic Targum it talks about how God sent the angels to lead the animals onto the ark and that the animals were uh, basically commanded instructed to be docile while on the ark and that they you know did not even chase each other like for meal or anything like that they uh, just stayed calm and quiet um, and allowed Noah to feed them and did their business. And then after, you know, the ark settled and they were uh, released and roamed free. And so there was a and also that the animals would led there by the angels. And so there was a supernatural hand to all of that as well. Uh, it's not, you know, just we think Noah just randomly. Uh, rounded up all of these creatures and put them into the ark that that's not the case at all there was something more to it than that and that kind of stuff is explained um, in other biblical manuscripts but um, I wanted to also and I'm not sure if you have heard about this but I wanted to ask your opinion on it that um you were speaking about the pterodactyls, and there's in the Native American tradition, there's this creature called a piazza. Um, and this piazza is just as you said, it's a, it's a, a like a feathered reptile, uh, like a plume serpent almost, you know, sort of like Quetzalcoatl and even the Nakash of Genesis. Uh, mm -hmm. But, anyways, uh, they said that it was even cited as recent as the late 1800s and that there are even current um, sightings of this particular creature around the world. And then um, one other thing I wanted to ask you, oh, and also they traced a cave where they found, and they call it the Thunderbird also um, in Native American lore, it's called the Thunderbird, but they traced it to this cave where they found all of these bones and that this particular creature, you know, picks up um, whatever cattle or, you know, whatever different types of creatures and takes it back to its cave. And it was found to have lived there. And uh, people can find this in a, a book called The Sky People, um, where the Native Americans talk about, the, you know, the connections with the uh, the fallen angels to uh, the sky people and they talk about this Thunderbird in that book as well but um, wanted to ask you also one other thing and it has to do with recent sightings of giants and I don't know if you heard but they said that uh, in Afghanistan that our special forces um, a company of soldiers had encountered a red-haired cannibal giant and that he had killed some of the uh, some of the special forces before another group was sent in to subdue him. And there's um, reports of it having been carried out, and that it was really vile smelling. And um, uh, but that this was a modern sighting of this, you know, this uh, kind of <laughs> Nephilim giant hybrid creature and then there's also in the Solomon Islands uh, a book that was released by a uh, Maurice Bonyan uh, and he talks about how the native people there they even recently as within the last uh, couple decades that some of the native peoples there were abducted by a group of giants that lived in the interior of the earth within these particular island chains there, the Solomon Islands, and that, um, that you know, these sightings have also been recent and that they believe the 
the Giants are still alive up until this day. And so I wanted to ask your opinion on that uh, because we see even in the reports of, you know, the conquistadors, um, you know, just going back to the, uh, the discovery of the Americas or the rediscovery and the exploration. The European uh, discovery. Yeah, the European discovery uh, that many conquistadors did encounter giants when they entered into these lands. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> that's uh, uh, Pigafetta, I think, was one of those that, that encountered those giants down there <clears throat> in uh, Patagonia. Mm -hmm, right. <clears throat> That uh, Piazza, I haven't heard that word. Uh, you know, speaking of uh, Native American uh, stories and all that, it it really rankles me not only personally, but as a as, as someone who wants to be a good scientist, that um, Native Americans' stories, if they don't fit in with, you know, what what uh, the academic guys think should be, are discounted. Because, oh, these right. are primitive Indians. They don't know anything. Mm -hmm. They prove they're liars. You, you know, there's what they're saying is, well, these, these Indians are making stuff up. Well, prove it. Right. And and it's a lot of this stuff, uh, once you get to looking into it, which I'm sure you've done, mm -hmm. well, sure, yeah, they were talking about something that's a different name than you would have thought. But there it is, this, uh, the, uh, the flying reptile, um, with feathers, I haven't heard, I know, I know there's a belief in feathered reptiles. I haven't heard anyone talk about that, that I know. <clears throat> but there was a guy here uh, <clears throat> that saw one, and he says that it, it, it was just furry, okay? I talked to a little girl uh, from Mexico down there in the mountains somewhere. She was talking about a couple, one of her girlfriends, <clears throat> had two little sisters. I think there were seven and 12. These are small little girls, not very big. They went out to the bathroom at dusk uh, one, one day. They said this big bird or something tried to swoop down and get them, probably the small one. And they were terrified. And I said, well, did, did, it, did it have feathers? Oh, no, no, no feathers. I said, well, did it have fur? She didn't know what fur was. <clears throat> so maybe there's three of these things. Maybe there's a feathered... <laughs> reptile maybe there's a furry uh pterodactyl type and the uh uh, uh the the big uh oh what they call it the, the thunderbird uh -huh, right i've read some stories where the you probably read the same story the uh <clears throat> the big these thunderbirds would come down and they'd uh, grab baby buffalo and take them back and eat them right, right. they got to capturing little indian kids so, uh -huh. so we got to put a stop to this. So one night they were, they, you know, they said, don't go up on this mountain. Well, all these big birds were up there and a lightning storm happened and killed them. So they went up and there they were. And uh, <clears throat> they, now the story I heard about that was that they came in ahead of thunderstorms. So they're called, right. you know, mm -hmm. birds. Well, down here in Texas, I observed one time, I was down in the canyon and this uh, August storm started blowing in from the north. Here comes all the vultures, way ahead of it, lit in their, their home camp and just waited the storm out. So, okay, well, that, that sounds like what they're saying. Here comes a storm. In front, in front of there, these big birds, these big feathered birds, uh, <clears throat> like the one they found down in uh, Argentina, I think, or Argentina Avis or something. So, you know, there are several different kinds of cats why aren't there several different kinds of flying animals that are supposed to be extinct or non-existent? I think, mm -hmm. I think that's exactly what these guys are saying. Yeah, I think so as well. And I'll, um, also just recently, and we're about to go to break, but uh, the Peruvian army, they had fielded reports from villagers of attacks by this huge bat-like creature. And there's actually photos of them having shot this creature and it had a 14 foot wingspan and it looked like a giant vampire bat i mean it's wow. really crazy people can you know google that and i'm sure that the the image will come up but it shows that there are strange anomalous type creatures out there that 
um, people don't consider to exist and these things are our reality and uh, they do go bump in the night and so uh, but we'll be right back everyone we're at the first break and then we'll pick up uh, the stories and uh, all right welcome back everybody um, wanted to turn this back over to you Joe and wanted to get you to comment a little bit further about the Giants and if you would uh, because I'm I believe a lot of people recognize you from the image that you have of the giant thigh bone. And I believe that that is part of your collection and in your museum. And so can you um, elaborate on that as well? Yeah, that's that's me with a white beard and the funky hat standing in front of that big leg bone and the, the drawing of the, the, uh, the skeleton. <clears throat> Uh, how that happened was about, oh gosh, 20 some years ago, a professor down in Florida sent me this article about these giants that were dug up over in three countries in the Middle East, Homs, Urin, Zora, and the Euphrates Valley. And he said, would you do me a sculpture that size? I want to show my students how big it was. So I did, and then I made myself a cast and blew up a, a, a skeleton, a drawing of a skeleton, to fit it. And... That leg bone is 47 and a half inches long, the femur. And the man that that fit, the bottom of his rib cage would come to about about eight and a half feet. That's a big guy. Wow, that is huge. So uh, it is just a sculpture, but it's it's based on a human uh, femur, sculpted by, you know, on a human femur. And it was dug up in the 50s, as best we could figure, like maybe mid-50s. Uh, road construction crews were <clears throat> bulldozing these mounds, <clears throat> I mean, these hills, which turned out to be burial mounds with these giant skeletons in them in three different places. Well, you know, it's dry over there. Those bones are kind of crumbly. These are construction guys, so they grab the swords, the gold, the whatever, the jawbone, maybe the skull, it all falls apart, and they, they measure some stuff and go on. Maybe the antiquities are called, maybe they're not, <clears throat> uh, department. <clears throat> but... You know, this is a frequent occurrence. Today, um, at least in, in, in America, if you find a skeleton, boy, most people are scared to death to do anything with it, especially a giant skeleton. Uh, a friend of mine owns a, a property with a mound on it. He, for some reason, was digging into it or hit it or something, <clears throat> saw these bones, and uh, there, were, there were the bones of a giant, at least nine feet tall. Made the mistake of calling university. University came in and said, okay, that's a giant. It's six and a half feet tall. And do not dig there anymore or go to jail. Six and a half feet tall, man, that's really scary. <clears throat> you know, that uh-huh. that's scary. Goliath, six and a half feet tall. <clears throat> so that's, you know, back when all these giants are being dug up, up into really the 60s, before... Uh, Universities were able to, as soon as they heard about something, a news story, send a guy out, you know, from the Smithsonian, collect those bones for scientific research. I'm doing quotes here, and never see them again. <clears throat> in fact, there was a <clears throat> cowboy not too far, about 40 miles south of here, uh, wanted to tell me his story. So I went down and interviewed him and taped his story. He said when he was in high school, he discovered the bones of a giant man down south of here in the red beds and he went to texas tech they brought over a professor who had to be a native american they excavated this thing and it was a 12 foot tall man with a three foot tall man buried with it not a kid but a man wow okay this is a real problem for evolutionists because you can't have little guys three feet tall that are regular people or people that are 12 feet tall <clears throat> that are not acromagliacs so they Anyway, they didn't know better, but they displayed it over here in the museum. And I think and I think I actually saw it when I was a kid uh, out through a school trip. <clears throat> Sometime, I believe, in 1960, the case was vandalized and the bones disappeared. Wouldn't you know it? Of course. So <clears throat> that professor's probably long gone. And uh, so is the cowboy. He's probably now 75 or 80. But this is uh, over and over. There was a man 12 feet tall 
over here on the edge of Texas and New Mexico, east east of uh, west of us. And so I thought, well, I'll go with those newspaper over there. There surely should be a story. A 12 foot tall man, 1930, <laughs> 35. Went over there and I told this guy, the editor, about it. He said, oh man. He said, there was somebody in here just accidentally burned all of our archives up into the 40s. Oh my goodness. Yeah, accidentally. Thought he was just a favor getting rid of all these old mag these old newspapers. Uh. So story in there, it's long gone. And uh, <clears throat> you know, that's uh, that giant you're talking about over there, in, I believe that's in Kand Kandahar. Kandahar, yes. Uh, L.A. Marzulli interviewed that guy, I'm pretty sure. Right. And uh, <laughs> looks to me like the whole thing is true. And exactly. If, if there's one, there's probably more. Right. Uh, and why do they always have red hair, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's my Irish and Scotch ancestors were bad people. <laughs> well, you know, just because you're big and tall doesn't make make you bad. I know a lot of guys that are real tall. They're nice people, you know. But when you get up be 12, 15, 18 feet tall, that's not, I, I just don't think you can say, oh, that's just a good diet. I, I That's something right. else. That, so that begs the question of, well, are they Nephilim? Right. Uh, probably, yeah. And both you and I, um, you know, being believers, we know that the Bible speaks about this race of giants coming into being from the fallen angels intermating with the daughters of man. Uh, Genesis 6, we see that there is the link for the origin and that we have further elaboration of this whole story in the book of Enoch and that um, Second Peter and Jude they also make mention of um, these angels going after strange flesh. And yeah. so these stories that we're talking about now are confirmation. And I think that one of the reasons why the Smithsonian and others, um, as far as disappearing a lot of this evidence and hiding this uh, knowledge from the public, uh, that it's contrary to evolution and the whole Darwinian uh, lie that they are promoting and, uh, you know, raising indoctrinating kids into through the educational system. And as you said, with, um, you know, these uh, these Hobbit people as well, that also there's been races and bones and skeletons of these people found worldwide as well uh, and existing at the same time as giants and other anomalous beings and so all of this is contrary to evolution and the whole uh, belief that we slowly evolved and progressed over time one being into another and that we evolved somehow of apes even though there are still apes here with us now which doesn't they're, make sense but they're smarter than we are <laughs> Come on, they don't have to go to school. They don't have to wear clothes. They don't care about fashion. They can't try to get married. They can't get divorced. They don't have car wrecks. They don't get tickets. They don't go to hell when they die. I hear you, brother. <laughs> Who's smart? Yeah, Say I agree. Those, those little people, unless you, I didn't want to cut you off there. Yeah, no, you're fine. Remember the story here a few years ago about uh, the little people found down there on Los Flores Islands? Yeah. Uh huh. Right. Okay. Oh, it's just, uh, how can we. How do we understand this? Well, they did depictions of them. And as always, they get a lying artist in there like myself, you know, to we need it to look a little like an ape. Well, how do you know it look like an ape? Well, we need to look like an ape because we can't have little people like that, you know, really fully human. Uh -huh, well, right. You know, it's just <clears throat> there's a when I was working on an allosaur site out there and uh, actually I was looking for one and found three of them. <clears throat> on the western slopes out near uh, uh, Rangeley and Dinosaur, Colorado. I went into uh, the little town of Dinosaur there and, and uh, bought a book called uh, Blue Mountain Friends. <clears throat> There's a history of the Blue Mountain out there from the Indian days is when the white man got there and through the kind of pioneer history. So a lot of really cool interesting stuff. Well, here's this little story. 
And it's about these two little girls that are like maybe eight or nine years old. One's a little white girl, one's an Indian girl. And they the, the re, re, related a conversation they had that day. And she, one of them says, well, what are we going to do? So the white girl says, I know. Let's go up on that, that hill or mesa or something up there and, and look for airheads. The little Indian girl says, oh, no. Why not? Because the pick to know might get us. The picked. You ever heard of the picks over in Scotland? The picks. Uh -huh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The pick to knows. The pick to knows. And, you know, well, I just, you know, kids don't, you know, they're all, they don't know anything. Uh -huh. Well, uh, here a while back, well, actually quite a few years ago now, these two truckers, again, not guys that write little cute novels, but these guys, they wanted to talk to me. So I went to see them up in Colorado. They said, man, we was in this box canyon, and this little thing, this person, was about seven inches tall. And you go, oh, boy, can't be true. She says, no, we followed it, went into a box canyon, and then it disappeared. I go, well, okay. Uh, sometimes things appear to disappear when they really don't. They just go behind something, uh -huh. all in the rock, and you can't see it. But anyway, that's what they told me. So... <clears throat> One another dig we're on out there in, in Colorado near Macedonia, uh, some NASA scientists came out. Some really kind of low key guys, but you know, uh, big brains and all that stuff. Uh -huh. This lady came with them who was uh, uh, Native American, can't remember what she, which tribe, but she was part Italian, but she looked Indian, a beautiful lady. And so after a few days, we got acquainted. I said, um, have you ever heard of the little people? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. She said, well, yeah. Said, uh, we throw our clothes out in the back for the little people. And people think we're just trashy, but we're throwing them out for the for the little people. Okay. Now, here's, here's a lady that's uh, with NASA. She's not making stuff up. She's not a nut. And whether you believe that or not, she certainly believed in the little people. Mm -hmm. so, Everywhere I've looked, there's that same kind of story. Right. And, okay, it's like smoke, please. If there's smoke, there's a fire somewhere. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. There's um, a text called the Cauldron Bible, and there's a particular chapter in it called the Scroll of Thothis, T-H-O-T-H-I-S. And in this particular chapter, which it talks about the primordial times, going back to the time of Atlantis and when the fallen angels were uh, ruling um, here upon the earth. And, and it talks about that there were, you know, dwarves and little people and one-eyed giants and all kind of um, mentions of, you know, men that were, covered fully in fur like you know bigfoot and uh things of that nature um it all described in this one particular story and it makes me think of what we're talking about now because it speaks of them as all existing and living in different parts of the world and that even these islands were you know some of the islands were known as where the the cyclops lived or where the little people, the dwarvish people lived. And uh, so all of these kind of things are um, preserved in the legends and oral traditions of native peoples worldwide. Um, we have even here in, in like near Nevada, Lovelock Cave, the Paiute Indians, there was the, the legend of, you know, their being at war with the red hair um, again, the cannibal giants, mm -hmm. and they spoke about having cornered them and um, backed them all up into that cave, and then they built a large fire and smoked them all out, and none of them escaped. And then, you know, the scientists, well, I guess 100 years later, or I'm not exactly sure, but um, people went in there to get collect the bat guano, and they even created a company uh, to do that, and then having removed the bat guano, which was really profitable for them, they then began to discover 
remnants of that culture. And there were what I think like 70 skeletons of these giants, men and women, and even children, all, um, they had all expired together. And there was duck decoys and all of these other artifacts that were found with them in that particular cave. And, you know, there were a lot of these skeletons found and preserved in like the Humboldt Museum. And, but, you know, a lot of that also disappeared. Um, Sure, yeah. Can you can you speak on on that? Yeah, I've been out to Lovelock Cave twice, and uh, <clears throat> first time we went out, we recorded the fact there was this what appeared to be a giant handprint about fourteen inches long of a five fingered person, looked like he slapped a wall with black paint or something like that. Uh, we had a little dab of that residue that uh, whatever analyzed. And the lab said it was uh, some sort of berry juice and proto-nylon. <laughs> what? Anyway. Proto-nylon, wow. Yeah, I, I have no idea what that means. <clears throat> well, we, uh, we, so we know the story pretty good. We went into town and to the, uh, some sort of place where the, uh, the pie got together for meetings and things like that. We spoke to Sarah Winnemuckas, one of her great, grand descendants a young woman oh, wow yeah and uh, of course she knows all the story and it's just like you said there was these wicked giants with with uh, long red or blonde hair and they were cannibals they were terrible the pirates tried to make peace with them try to bring them into their tribe they just said terrible things and and, and finally they said look if you aren't going to act like people then we're going to kill you uh -huh. so they they fill that cave full of uh brush and Apparently, the giants pulled it in on them, and they just kept pulling it in until they suffocated the whole bunch. So we asked this, uh, went up there. If you go up to Winnemuck, to that uh, Lovelock Cave, they filled all the chambers where these people probably were, these giants. They filled it with dirt, so you can't do anything, but there's this one big room in there. And oh, the, ceiling's, wow. the ceiling's all blackened, and they got a platform out there for you to stand on. But outside, there's a a plaque that tells you all about the Piute Indians, and they lived here, and this is their duck decoys and all this stuff. All Piute Indians. Uh -huh. So we asked this uh, young lady there. She says, that wasn't our cave. We didn't use that cave. Oh, maybe I'll tell the uh, BLM to go put the right story up there. That cave is inherited, inhabited by evil Red-headed giants. Right. Uh, I don't think you're going to do that. <laughs> but, she, you know, she, like she said, we didn't use that cave. Well, then where'd all that stuff come from? Well, it wasn't theirs. Uh -huh. There's also, uh, we we talked to a guy, I won't tell you where, but we happened to run into him. And I forget how he came up. <clears throat> this guy was 50s, big guy, worked there locally. And he sort of looked around every direction. He says, you know, I helped rebury a nine-footer out here. Sent back to the Smithsonian, mm. or whoever sent it back. And he couldn't tell us much more, and that's all he wanted to say, but he reinterred one of those giants. Wow. Wow. Yeah. But they don't exist, you know, so. Yeah, yeah right. Indians making up stories like that. You can't trust them. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, it's... Um... It's interesting, you know, we have the, the native traditions and the stories of these red-haired cannibal giants, but then um, the guy, uh, Jim Viera, he him. and his brother, yeah, they did uh, a book where they went through all the different, the digital uh, renditions of a lot of these old newspapers from and right. searching their databases, and they came up with several hundred reports of giants being discovered and found in like you said um the ancient burial mounds that used to be all over this country oh. and yeah and then we even have um uh, in a speech that abraham lincoln gave he makes mention of the giants that had lived here before the indigenous peoples and so uh, these kind of things you know are part of the historical record and if people really open themselves to this kind of research, these kind of discoveries can be made. 
um, and you know skulls even with horns being discovered in places like Pennsylvania yep. and other places um, so you know these kind of discoveries were found even here in America numerous mm-hmm. numerous uh, uh, evidence as far as you know skeletons and things of that nature but um, can you comment on that as well well uh, in my uh, <clears throat> I published a book in 2012 uh, called Giants Against Evolution. Half the book is on uh, all these accounts all over the world showing there were giant men. These are these are not seven footers or most of them aren't eight footers. They're bigger than that. Uh-huh. Uh, they they fit the story of the Nephilim. They were mostly evil. They were Satanists, cannibals, homosexuals, all this stuff. Right. Uh, none of them were. They weren't choir boys. Uh, only a couple of instances that I came across in uh, ancient stories or old stories. <clears throat> uh, one of the accounts for the, the natives in uh, Florida or somewhere talked about some of the giants were had black hair and black beards and some were red. Uh-huh. And some of the giants were nice. I think the ones with black hair were nice. And But but that's yeah. relative. You know, I mean, I don't know what yeah. that means. They just didn't try to kill them, I guess. Right, right, right. Another account said... I think this was among a Cherokee or somewhere down there in the south that the Native American men liked to marry the giant women because they were so beautiful. <laughs> huh, interesting. Yeah, right. I mean, <clears throat> uh, I guess they didn't mind being bossed around, but anyway. <laughs> right. But, you know, you that, that means so those giant women down there must have been some of the nicer people. Uh-huh. Now, you know, if you're eight feet tall, that is not really, that's just barely a giant. Right. So there could be normal people, just a good, healthy, tall people. Maybe that's who they're talking about. Uh, it really all the, the, the mean ones, you don't get, you know, the, the giants that are uh, the, the, like the uh, Ojibwa and the pirates were had to deal with and other uh, native tribes. Those were all bad individuals they didn't they didn't say anything good about those so why is it that most of the accounts by native americans of these giants but they were bad well that harkens back to the nephilim the nephilim Uh were nice right okay so there's a connection there why isn't that evidence right and also you know the even the book of enoch speaks about because they were strong uh, and they were heroes, you know, like the men of renown, they were haughty and proud and they believed themselves, you know, to be superior the, to <laughs> mankind. And um, they often not only slaughtered, but abducted and feasted and uh, took wives of, you know, again, of all which they chose. Um, and so they would mistreat humans um because of their superior size and so and and these kind of stories are passed down in tradition and um as far as what we see with the red-haired cannibal giants and their abduction of people uh, even um stephen quell he wrote the book on true legends Uh and in that book he makes mention of a lot of the the myths and the oral traditions of the native people of the kind of evil that they would even abduct and then cut the flesh off of living individuals um, and roast it and then eat it in front of them and do this until the person died. I mean, that's the kind of abomination that they were involved in. Yeah, that is. Well, you know, that brings up an interesting thing of the arrogance of the giants. Right. Um, why would the royalty of Europe, and at least some of them, and this is, they've never told me personally, but why would they claim uh, to be divine, the divine right of kings? You've heard right. that, uh-huh, right? Yes. The uh-huh. divine right of kings. Now, I'm not sure that's just European. That may be uh, Oriental, African. It's worldwide, yeah. Okay, well, maybe that's because they were part divine. Right. Like Gilgamesh said, he was yes. part divine because his father was an angel. Exactly, well, right. Okay. <clears throat> so there again, there's something which persists to this day 
What's the answer? Well, it looks like the Nephilim. Right. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the Habsburgs of Europe claim kin or descendancy from the uh, the Anakin, I think. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah, the sons of Anak. Yeah. Wh why? Why that? If it isn't true, I mean, why make that up? So. Right. There again, everywhere you look, people say, well, there's no evidence of giants. Well, I don't know. I think there is. Right. I think there's overwhelming <laughs> evidence of giants and these bloodlines and and their connections to the Nephilim. And certainly they celebrate these connections uh, amongst themselves, the elites and these bloodlines. But uh, we'll be right back for second hour. Everyone. Welcome back for second hour. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio, and I'm honored to have as guest with me, Joe Taylor. Uh, Joe, wanted to give you a chance to comment on what I was speaking about before we went to break, um, just about the, the giants and the sons of God, you know, these heroes of old. Also, the connections with the bloodlines, because certainly the elites celebrate and believe that they are of this um otherworldly race of these hybrid entities uh and you know the whole connection again with the genesis 6 the sons of god taking wives of the the daughters of man and creating this race of giants that this is you know even when um israel went into canaan that they encountered these sons of anak and spoke about how they were grasshoppers in their sight well <clears throat> there again uh we live in the in an occidental world the western world over here doesn't generally like miracles or <clears throat> anything that's you know you can't uh <clears throat> explain physically <clears throat> so the idea that an angel <clears throat> a spirit or a spiritual being could marry a human woman and have children is uh, man. There's a lot of people, especially Christians. They just can't. They can't go that. They they right. just can't have that at all. <clears throat> and part of part of that's uh, the we don't believe in miracles over here unless you're Pentecostal maybe or something. But most people they don't think like that. The other thing <clears throat> is uh, uh, in Matthew where it says that. You know, the the, the uh, Pharisees were costing Christ. And, you know, this this woman had seven husbands. And which one is she going to be with in heaven? And Jesus rebuked them. They were just trying to trip him up. He says, you don't even know what you're talking about. Nobody's married in heaven. Uh -huh. They'll be like the angels of God that, right. that weren't married. All right. Well, some people say that's because they didn't have any women up there. No women angels. Okay. But they immediately make the assumption, and I'm guilty of this myself a long time ago. I thought, well, okay, then the angels can't marry. But I never gave the thought to it, didn't have to, you know, 40 years ago. So <clears throat> I've tried to say this many times. It doesn't say they can't marry and reproduce and have children. It just says they don't in heaven. Right. If you take them out of heaven, their first estate, and put them on earth, there's nothing says they can't marry women, and that's what the Bible says. You know, Genesis clearly says that the sons of Elohim married women, the daughters of, of Adam. Right. Daughters of Adam are could be Seth's daughters or Cain's daughters. It doesn't matter. They're the daughters of Adam. They're just human women. And the, the Elohim, the, uh, his sons, those are the angels. It can't be anything else. But man, people just go berserk sometimes. Uh, some of my friends cannot have that. And uh, I don't try to beat them up. I just say that's what the Bible says. And I've been exactly. studying this now thoroughly, you know, for about 15, 20 years, actually longer than that. And everything I see points to the fact that these things have been right in front of our face all these years. The giant, the, the heroes of old, the, uh, uh, the Olympics, the Olympiads and all that. Uh, you go anywhere in the world, you find these stories of the heroes, and they're basically all, I think, talking about the fallen angels and the Nephilim sons. Uh, otherwise, yeah, totally you gotta think everybody just made this stuff up. Right. You know, and again, prove that people make stuff up. Shakespeare did. He's a writer. 
you know, uh, I could make stuff up. You can make stuff up and write a book about nothing ever happened. But that's not history. That's not what they're telling us. They're, they're accounting of things and people and beings that existed. And they're telling us what they look like. You know, if you, uh, you've seen Greek phrases where they uh, uh, show men with wings, uh, right. you know, <clears throat> taking women. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, if you go to Peru over there, some of those uh, fra- fabrics over there, they show winged men, bird men. Uh-huh. And uh, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> maybe they're all moth men. I don't know. But, oh, uh, well, angels have wings. Apparently, angels do have wings. I don't know if all of them do. And uh, th- then you get into this. I don't want to divert here. But just to show you, the Bible is not some little book of poetry and feel good stuff. It's a book of some heavy history and some really, really serious things. Like uh, over there where it talks about the the women with wings that, okay, that flew up in the air. Uh, I don't know. I've never seen a woman with it wings. Right. But it says they had them. They're like stork wings. Uh-huh. It's like feathers. So is that true or not? Yeah, the Bible says it is. It doesn't say they were like women with wings. It says they're women with wings. Right. It speaks about the lion men of Moab. Lion, yeah. Of which there are sculptures. Yes. You know, they're, uh, <clears throat> they get to the whole thing of um, the griffin. You know, the right. griffin shows up everywhere. So, you know, did, are they just making it up or is that a real being? Well, why don't we have bones? Well, you don't have bones of everything. And how do you know there aren't bones? Right. You no. Know? How do you know there isn't someone, one of them in a cage somewhere? People make the assumption that, well, if I didn't see it, it doesn't exist. Well, that's just, you don't have to assume that. That's just assuming too much. And <clears throat> so how could those things possibly come to being? Well, one, God could have created them. Or two, the angels could have made it with an animal and that animal made it with something else and end up with right. some hybrid that continues on like the quarter horse. You know, yeah. now the quarter horse is a stable uh, uh, breed. And before, there really wasn't such thing as a quarter horse back before 20s or 30s. So <clears throat> why would it persist if it wasn't true? And, I, you know, we're, we're Occident, Occidentals over here. We, you know, we just don't think... Well, like the American Indian, they're Orientals. They're used to be. They think in terms of, of uh, poetry, like my heart sailed like an eagle. Oh, your heart isn't an eagle. Well, he didn't say that. He said his heart soared like an eagle, idiot. Can't you understand poetry? You know what I mean? <laughs> we don't think in terms of, um, uh, it's just all got to be one, two, three, and, and uh, hard, cold stuff. Well, you know, that there's more to life. Than, than just uh, hard, cold stuff. Right. Yeah, Barosis, um, in in the, the the account by Alexander Polyhister, he speaks about how um, before the flood that the angels involving themselves with the, in the Book of Giants also, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, speaks about the miscegenation that the angels corrupted everything, humanity, uh, the animals uh, and even plants that they were cross breeding and involving themselves in different manner with everything so that all flesh became corrupted. And um, it talks about how there were, you know, these uh, um, winged humans and also the hi- hippo centaurs, the half horse and yeah. half man. Um, and also the you know fish and and part uh, serpentine like uh, Cecrops, the founder of Athens, that he was a human from above, but uh, reptilian or serpent-like below, mm-hmm. uh, much like we see Medusa and the Gorgons, that they also um, you know took on that kind of form, and so they were all kind of weird anomalous and hybrid creatures. Um, prior to the flood of uh, Noah's day. And I think that one of the reasons why uh, God brought on the flood was to 
you know, wipe out these hybrids and that they were being abominations and also the children of the Nephilim, the fallen angels, they were um, <clears throat> warring against humanity and cannibalizing and uh, making life, you know, contentious. And so uh, bringing on the flood, he restored everything and then told <clears throat> Noah and family to go forth and multiply and replenish the earth. And so something to all that for sure. That's right. <clears throat> well, I wanted to give you a chance to also speak about uh, the Mothman, which is an incredibly interesting um, account and something that I saw the Mothman prophecies a long time ago and how people were encountering this winged being that had these red glowing eyes and you said that in your part of the country, your part of the world, that um, there are actual experiences and encounters uh, with this particular being. And so can you elaborate on that as well? And also what you think of, you know, because are these creatures also tied uh, in similarity to the uh, Nephilim and the hybridization of, um, you know, creatures and beings? There have been uh, five people that I know of in Crosbyton, where I live, a little bitty old town here in Nowheresville. <clears throat> five people have seen this Mothman thing. <clears throat> uh, three women and two men that I know of. One woman uh, was sitting out on the highway over here. Uh, it's, it's actually a farm route 651, which runs right by my museum. North and south, it's only 62 miles long, and then it stops. And on that road, there's been all this stuff happen. UFOs, uh, weird things in the sky, and this mothman. So this lady is out there, <clears throat> smoking a cigarette one night, about to go to bed, 11 o'clock. She senses something above her, or hears something, looks up, and, oh, my Lord, here's this, here's this weird-looking thing flying, hovering above her with a face she describes as being really horrible, like Jeepers Creepers in the movie, I guess. So she's terrified. About four o'clock in the morning, one of her friends is uh, driving by her house out to the gin out in the country to take her husband something to eat. Do it about 40 miles an hour, and bam, she hits something right on the edge of town, dents her fender, bumps her head, and this thing goes flying into the ditch slides across it left a mark uh, where he slid. <clears throat> a 16-wheeler saw the whole thing happen. He stopped, told her to get back in the car. That thing's not human. And he said, I see him out here this time of night. I'm going, I've never seen one. I live here. Anyway, she goes over and, and she's a brave gal. She touches the, the thing, laying on the ground. He gets up and flutters his wings, and then just flies up above her, flies in a circle around him, and then flies off. Crazy. Yeah. Not like a bird hovering or a, or a butterfly. I mean, this, I mean, I, it, it defies, to me, it defies uh, description as a flying creature because it doesn't appear to flap its wings like, like you think it would. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the same lady, this was a maybe in the last 10 years, Last November, right after my conference, she was driving down through Blanco Canyon, where, which is not far from where I grew up. It's just a ranch down there, you know, and I think she went over a little creek or a dry creek, and all of a sudden, bam, hits something. And she stops, gets out, and here's this creature. And this time she says, what do you want? Who are you? What are you? Well, uh... And he flies away. Yeah, there. Um, I I believe these kind of sightings have been happening in many different spaces and places uh, across the country. And so, do you think that the there are multiple types, and that this is maybe a a race? Even though if it is hybrid, maybe they're not able to reproduce, or or that this is a spiritual entity uh fallen angelic um but present in body you know that 
it even says of <clears throat> Satan that he can um, present himself as an angel of light. And so, right. yeah. So what do you, what do you think about uh, these particular beings? And well, <clears throat> the the uh, three times this one lady has seen it, she describes the wings more like uh, rags. <clears throat> You know, that's kind of like a moth. A moth that's beat its wings up, maybe. <clears throat> mm. uh, you know, it's, it can only be so many things. One, it could be a bird, a species we don't know anything about. Could be a, a demonic manifestation. Uh, could be an angel. Could be an angel of God. Maybe it's one of God's angels. We, we don't know what, what all he's created. Uh, <clears throat> or could be a hybrid. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that ought to be looked at. Could it be a mix of, of these angels who could fly and or some sort of a bird? I don't know. It's We're trying to find out more about them. I know there's other places that are having Mothman meetings and, and things like that. I don't know much about them except to know that, that uh, they have the same frightening reaction. And <clears throat> this lady hit one twice, did it her car, bumped her head, and not far from here in a little place called Sundown, Texas, a friend of mine went over and interviewed one of the guys that, that was chased by one of them over there. This is maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago. <clears throat> and they were driving, in the, they were in the back of a pickup trying to get away from it. It was flying behind them. They were going as fast as that pickup would run, which is maybe 80 miles an hour or so. And this thing was clawing at the back of the tailgate of the pickup. Now, uh, can, a, can a demon claw at things? Can a demon be hit and knocked down and bend a fender? You know, I don't know. Maybe I, uh, demons are a strange things. I, but right. bodies can bodies can do that. You know, um, there, there's a case of a guy over here in one of our uh, little towns. Big guy. I guess he was on... on uh, one of those drugs that drives you, you know, crazy. You do was it uh, uh, PCP or something like that? Uh -huh. <clears throat> anyway, he was coming after this guy in his house, and he shot him five times with a gun, and the guy just kept coming. Right. So, <clears throat> is it possible for beings? It's possible for man. You know, there are people have been hit by cars in the war. You know, you get blown up, and these soldiers keep on fighting, and then. As soon as they get to a safe place, they collapse and, you know, nearly die. But for a moment, they can sustain, they can keep their activities up in spite of their injuries. So is that what's happening to this moth man that gets hit? Why would he get hit? You know, why would he stand there in front of a car coming? Mm -hmm. The deers do that. So there's a lot we don't know. And, and uh, I'm trying not to make any rash judgments. And I'm trying to encourage other, everybody else. Don't just say it's this or that. Say it could be this or that. And let's let's find out. Let's do some real research on this thing. <clears throat> but yeah, absolutely. There again, it, it harkens back to: Are there really hi hybrids? Well, uh, the Book of Giants and and uh, Jasher and all those are talking about that. You have to call those things lies, because that's what they're talking about. And who says they're a lie? They're not accepted canon, you know, at least in our Bible, but that doesn't make them untrue. So I, I right. uh, <clears throat> it's a strange phenomenon. And why is it becoming more pronounced? I don't know. I never heard of these things when I grew up here. You know, maybe they did happen. Maybe somebody saw them because uh, out there on the ranches and the farms, you know, the people back then didn't have, he didn't use a telephone very much and nobody usually had a camera with them. So, a lot of these things could be seen and you just forget about it. I know a lady, one of my cousins saw a UFO right out just a mile from our farm, came down, she and her mom were driving down the road at night. This thing, this light comes at them and then boom, up over their car. And I recounted that to her here a while back. She said, I had forgotten all about that. Well, it's a pretty heavy thing to forget, but we do, you know? All right. So, Maybe with my Project 651, uh, if I start publishing it locally, maybe more of these farmers and cowboys will come out and go, yeah, my dad, you know, this, or I saw something. And uh, the more you know, the closer you get to the truth. That's what we're trying to do. Well, 
certainly there are a lot of things that are unexplained and that are alluded to within the biblical text. Mm -hmm. And understanding that the Bible is prophetic, it, in my opinion, shows um, that these kind of things that are spoken about that are anomalous and that are hard to believe by modern humanity uh, and modern researchers that there is evidence for their existence within the world and certainly native peoples worldwide speak about and cover and share uh, stories and even you know regular people now um like you the lady you're talking about they speak about encounters you know with these particular beings and even in this day and age like the stories of the kandahar giant and uh the solomon island giants um and so we really have to reconsider um, all of the, as we made mention, the conquistadors. They spoke about and have chronicled in their journals of their encounters with these giants. Um, and that often they were the leaders, the rulers of native peoples in different parts of the, the country. Uh, even Patagonia, you know, meaning Bigfoot. Um, which when we come back from break, um, that's what I'd like to speak about as well. Uh, yeah. Bigfoot and this particular being, which, you know, again, this encounters with this creature uh, in different forms. Some, you know, say white fur, some say brown, some say red. Uh, but worldwide, there are encounters with uh, this particular creature. Uh, and then the, in, in the Sumerian traditions, it speaks about um, when they first came, the fallen angels, when they were first banished here and came to this world, that the Bigfoot that was the hominid, the, the type of being that was here present upon the earth um, in their stories. And they attempted to make a slave race of, of these particular beings. But... Anyways, we'll go into that when we come back from break. Uh, we're three minutes out, Joe. And so if you would, can you give out your website and your contact information and uh, also where your museum is? And, um, you know, you said that it's in repairs now, but uh, when people can find out more about when to come and visit and support you in your work there. Okay, the, the website is mountblanco.com, M-T-B-L-A-N-C-O. You should properly say Mont Blanco, but if you say Blanco, you say Monte. So we say Mont Blanco. So it's mountblanco.com, and the uh, email is mountblanco1 at aol.com. I also have an art site, which I haven't done really much with. I've just got it up. It's called uh, Joe Taylor Art and Music dot com. I know there are just a lot of my uh, various paintings and artwork over the years. I decided to just put out there, and if anybody wants a print of them, they'll be available. So that's there too. That's one of my occupations. That's my main occupation has been an artist, which has opened the doors to uh, in paleontology and sculpting and uh, digging. You know, it helps to be an artist if you're if you want to be a good digger. <clears throat> so. Uh, that's uh, I've also done a lot of illustration. If I write a book, I take a lot of photographs and do illustrations. So that that helped in uh, actually fooling people because I put out a newspaper one time, and it was just me doing all the artwork and the photography. And I went to a little printer over here, and everybody thought I had a big staff, you know, and an art art deal and all that. It was just me writing everything, taking all the pictures, and and get it printed. So it made people think I was more than I was, but it's just because I'm a graphic artist. So <clears throat> my museum is in Crosbyton, Texas, like Bing Crosby, Crosbyton. We're uh, about 32 miles east of Lubbock, Texas, and about 30 miles from the, uh, 30 minutes from the international airport. It's just a little cow town and a farm town, but uh, we're right on the edge of the canyon. If you drop off the canyon, you start going through the, the human layer where you find the human skeletons and wolf, coyote, 
some horses, buffalo. Then you go down into uh, the mammoths, mastodons, and all that stuff. You finally get down to uh, the uh, red beds and the hard red, hard brown sandstone, where you have all the crocodilians, the giant crocodiles, 25, 40 feet long, giant salamanders, 10, 12 feet long. Wow. So, so that's where I've done a lot of my works down there. And also in Buffalo, I've collected a lot of buffalo bones. I love buffalo bones. So <clears throat> we're right out here in, you know, on the edge of the, uh, I, I call it, this is where the abatement of Noah's flood stopped. It's just a few miles from town because if you've ever been around a, a farm that's on a slope, you'll notice as the, it, when it rains, it cuts little grand canyons at the bottom of the field. And where the water stops, that's where the little canyon stops, okay? That's what you see at Crosbiton out here. And it eroded all the way to the coast, up up to here. And then the water ran back in the ocean and left us with the plains up here. And that's how you find all fossils anyway, pretty much, except the ones that are buried in volcanic ash after the flood. And I've worked on a lot of that stuff, too. In fact, we have a layer here of white dirt, white clay. And you find the same stuff everywhere you find white dirt and white clay. You find the same thing you horse, giant uh, animals, and so on. All right, we'll be right back for final segment. All right, welcome back, everybody, for final segment. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Bigfoot, Yeti, Sasquatch, um, many different names uh, depending on where you are in the world, but certainly, again, like with the Giants, there's worldwide sightings and multiple accounts and ancient legends surrounding the existence of this being as well. And so, Joe, in your research, uh, what do you believe uh, with regard to these particular <laughs> beings? And uh, have you had you know, anybody near you with personal sighting? Is this something that also exists where you live? Uh, yes, <clears throat> there was a deacon in our church here. He was a very conservative person, just a regular guy, never made up a story in his entire life. <laughs> he was he was a he d- drove a delivery truck. <clears throat> he was coming uh, towards Crosbyton uh, South through Blanco Canyon on 651, and as he <clears throat> uh, pulled up out of the out of the canyon up the the slope, they're getting out had to gear down and he got down pretty slow and as he gets to the top here's something whack the the truck and he thinks he's blown out a tire he doesn't know what so he stops he goes around and looks there's nothing wrong with the truck there's no tires okay gets back in and all of a sudden the truck begins to bounce up and down and rock back and forth and so he gets it in gear and takes off and he looks to the river mirror and he said it looked like an, an eight-foot-tall ape jumping up and down with his arms in the air. Huh. Okay. So <clears throat> there have been other other accounts, uh, like I, I may have already said, but there was a friend of mine shot one, a white one, or a shimmering one. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> he, I said, well, how do you know he didn't die? He said, well, they didn't know. They took off. They shot it a bunch of times. And like I said, humans can sustain several bullets and not die, not die right then. So is it possible for one of these things, which maybe has a whole different musculature than we do that's tougher? Anyway, he took me out to the site where he saw this thing, and uh, here's the here's a grove of trees, and they're about three inches across, and I notice as we're standing around the, at the edge of the grove, a bunch of these trees have been pushed down at the base. They've been bent over, and some of them had been there quite a while, long enough to kind of die, and but one was still fairly alive and it had been bent over. Uh, there's you'd have to have some real power to to do that. And, and there's they don't drive trucks and there's no vehicles in there. Uh, cattle won't do that. <clears throat> so it was a little bit creepy, you know. Like gosh, that that grove right there could be housing who knows what's in there. In fact, this cowboy who had been injured, he says that you're going to take care of me if that thing comes out here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, my bad knee will lamp along here. <laughs> so what disturbs me, I was just recently up in, uh, we went to an excursion to Death Valley with uh, Don Monroe, M.K. Davis, uh, Ron Moorhead, and Daniel Jones came along. 
we didn't get to go where we wanted to go because things didn't work out, but it had been an awful trip and probably a good thing we didn't. But we went to some other places real remote and uh, they went on up into the to the sort of the mountains there. And I stayed down below because I got a bad knee. And I look around, here's a branch laying on the ground. I go, how'd that branch get here? There's no trees around here. It has just been pulled off not, not long ago. And I go, okay, that's, that's what, uh, they allege you to do is tear off limbs and stuff. Uh-huh. So Ron, Ron Moorhead's there. He told me that he, as well as his daughter, both saw a Bigfoot manifest out of nothing into their view. Wow. Okay, and I, I can't call him a liar. I wasn't there. I, But that raises some serious problems. Uh, Ron says, well, maybe they go into a portal. I go, what the heck's a portal? You know, uh, angels can come and go. Demons can come and go. You know, when you have a demon inside of it, you can't see it. See its manifestation, but you don't see it necessarily. Um, So I don't know. That's been a real puzzle with me that they can appear and disappear. Uh, One explanation is that, that if you're within maybe 100 feet of them, they see you and there's nothing behind them that they can emit some kind of a frequency which puts you to sleep temporarily. This is uh, Dr. Jeff Muldrum was uh, was telling this uh, thing. And they just walk away while you're temporarily out of it for four or five seconds. They just walk away and they have a long stride. So when you open your eyes, look out there, they have disappeared. Maybe it's the same thing if they put you to sleep by they see you, they hum this hum or whatever it is. You go to sleep temporarily. They walk over, and now when you wake up, they're in your sight. I didn't tell that to Ron, but perhaps that's worth looking into. Otherwise, it sounds to me like you've got a spiritual being. If they, if they can come and go like that and be invisible, I, I don't see how that could be an ape or an animal or a hybrid. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but... I can tell you this, from the, all the people I've talked to, uh, they apparently sometimes weep over their dead, the young, the babies, they weep over the baby. Uh, they tear up, they pull up trees, big trees. They'll stack them in, in uh, together. One up, two of them are right side up, and the other one's upside down, 40 feet tall. Takes a strong person to do that. Uh, this one guy told me that he was out in, I believe, Arizona, I've got on a film, he said he saw this kind of little grove of trees over there. I went over there and here's the whole the whole hill is covered in bones. And he's kind of like creeped out by it. And I said, well, were like cow bones, deer bones? He said, well, yeah, maybe everything like that. So that's another friend of mine says they'll find these bone piles. And apparently it's Bigfoot. They kill a deer. They, they eat it. And I don't know, maybe they completely like a cat can lick the bone clean you know cat can lick a bone completely clean with a rough tongue uh some friends of mine up in nebraska uh say they can put out peanut butter as long as you open the jar that the lid so they get it off they'll come in and a few days later bring the peanut jar back peanut butter back empty with the lid on it wow and uh (laughs) this one lady she's uh kind of into the fossil thing and and, and has a little Bigfoot museum. Apparently, one of these things came by and left her a uh, like a, a buffalo tooth or something on, on her the the little walk of her or wall of her around her house. So it's like, well, you know, do, do they is that a little gift, a little thank you for the peanut butter? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> right on. Yeah, you you just don't know, right? You don't know. There's uh, where did I hear this? Somebody said, uh, oh. They were looking ever up on a hill or something and looked down on a group of them and said, finally, one of them looked up at them and, and said, you're not welcome here or something like that. Oh, wow. Mm. Okay. Well, now, they can talk. A minor bird can talk. Cats seem to talk. But, but for someone to say words you can understand, that, uh-huh. that has a human or an angelic quality to it. Right. Uh, um, I, you know, <clears throat> which brings up, uh, I suppose you know about uh, uh, what was his name, Zena, over there in in Russia. 
was it the child of a supposed Sasquatch and and uh, no uh-uh. Please well sure. they, okay they captured this female what they're thinking was a Sasquatch and she didn't try to get away or tear the place up but these Russian men took advantage of her and she had I think six children all of them died because she'd take them down to the river and wash them and they'd freeze to death they'd die of ex- exposure Oh, wow. so, they, so the last one, they kept the baby from her, didn't let her do that, and it grew into a man. Well, that man looks not unlike Abraham Lincoln. He's sort of an acromegaliac, but, but he looks like a regular kind of bony-faced guy with uh, full features. And they apparently they have his bones now. They buried him, and I think they've dug him up. So my question is, well, okay, was that just a wild woman? Uh, who had become covered in hair, or maybe that, you know, just because you're covered in hair doesn't make you not a human. Right. Or just because you don't have hair doesn't make you not a human. But there are men that don't have hardly any hair on their face, like Peruvians. Well, they're still men. So there's a great variety of, in, in the, uh, the, the race of man. There's a great variety. Is it possible this was a wild woman that these guys took advantage of? She wasn't an ape or a Sasquatch at all. Um, I've got a drawing in my museum that some people gave me, a forensic <clears throat> drawing. They uh, were up in um, Oklahoma, Indiana. I should know better. But anyway, they were. They saw this, what appeared to be a wild man or a Bigfoot down at the creek digging out crawfish with a full-size deer thrown over his shoulder. And eventually he looked up and saw them and took off, ran down the middle of the creek or the river, crossed the sandbar with this thing on his back. So they they had plaster with him, went there and plastered this this track, one of his tracks. It's just a regular human footprint. Uh-huh. Looks like a guy maybe six, seven feet tall with a regular, not a Bigfoot, not a Sasquatch footprint, with the toes all the same size going across equally. It's like a human footprint. Uh and they drew a, they had a forensic artist, these guys were cops, they had a <clears throat> forensic artist draw what they saw. It, it looks like something you'd see uh, uh, on a football field today. He had a kind of a low, a low brow, uh, I mean a low hairline. Uh, he had a beard and he was sort of uh, brown. But, you know, you can get brown if you're, out, if you're outside all the time, you'll end uh-huh. up being and it looked to me, that don't look like Sasquatch. That looks like a human being. Well, then, are there are there men that just live out in the wild so long that they they learn to eat raw meat, uh, crawdads? They sleep in a bunch of leaves like an animal. Yeah, yeah, that's possible. And it doesn't mean they don't have a soul. It doesn't mean they're not a human being. But uh, and maybe they get covered in hair. So <clears throat> again, that doesn't make a difference. I was in the army with a guy, a white guy. In fact, I'm not sure his name wasn't the same as mine, but this guy uh, had to shave his nose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, he was covered like an animal. But he uh-huh. wasn't an animal. He was a regular guy of, I think, of Irish descent. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> there again, people need to keep an open mind. Uh, right. I asked this Bigfoot researcher 30 years ago. I said, can they be blonde? They said, yeah, they can be red, blonde, brown, or black. And now, this uh, couple of, occur- of uh, occurrences, they've been white or shimmering or kind of a kind of a whitish color. Maybe that's just because they're really old. I don't know. <clears throat> um, but it, it seems to me like uh, this guy said there are, four, there are some with four toes, some with five, and some have been known to have six toes. What are the different species, or is it just like... Uh, Two, three brothers, one has blonde hair, one has red hair, one has brown hair. Maybe it's just that. Mm-hmm. But uh, <clears throat> there's there's a lot more to know about Bigfoot. And um, they're, they're, here's my conclusion of Bigfoot. They're too human to be an animal. And they're too animal to be a human. Uh-huh. So we're left with a quandary. And uh, my mind's not made up what they are, and I'm, I'm willing to, to hear more stories. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, have you heard of the connection between like um, 
they said that there have been some where they've seen Bigfoots like emerge out of UFOs. I have heard um, that. Yeah, so there seems to be a connection there as well. And that's a strange. Um, but there also seems to be a connection between uh, UFOs and um, like the giants. For instance, Barry Shamish, he did uh, wrote a book about the giants that uh, visited Israel. And I believe it was like 1992 or something of that nature. And um, and there was also a sighting in Russia where a whole group of school children witnessed uh, these nine foot beings come out of this uh, craft in, I believe it was Verona or something, something with a V there in Russia. And so there seems to be connections between the giants and Bigfoot and also these unidentified uh, flying objects, which in my mind, um, you know, the extraterrestrials or ancient aliens, uh, they are the fallen angels, the, the demonic, you know, presence of the fallen angels in, in the description of what Enoch describes as, you know, the same, the watchers, the sons of God mating with the daughters of man, creating the men of renown, that it's all the same thing just here now in modern times. Well, you know, the the connection between Bigfoot and the, the UFOs, the other explanation might be they're abducting them. <laughs> True that, yeah, absolutely. You know, maybe they're part of, I don't know. Yeah, right. I've heard twice now, and um, uh, actually down to 651 up here, uh, along that same road there, uh, my brother, who's a cowboy, doesn't make stuff up. He just don't, he won't stretch things. He'll make them less than they were. Uh, he saw a big light up there, and he watched it a while, and all of a sudden it just took off faster than any man-made plane could fly. And he says, I don't know what it was. It's an unidentified flying object. That's all he knew. But uh -huh. same path is right down 651. And that's where the Bigfoot, there's been two Bigfoot sightings that I know of out there. Um, we've had a werewolf story that I can't even get into that. But uh, I I was writing a, a local newspaper article here for a while and uh, <clears throat> called Artistic License. I was just writing about everything. And I was criticizing, maybe I'm gonna tell the story. I was criticizing people for watching uh, the Teenage Werewolf series, that that was a bad show. I said, you know, I know some Indian fellows uh, from, I think they were Navajo. They were uh -huh. saying, well, you know, that's that's real. These right. uh, these right. shamans out there, when, whenever they get into their, do their dances or whatever, said their face is so contort that you'd think they're an animal. If they don't turn into an animal. I don't think their fingernails grow. But apparently with this demon, this spirit, this animal, animist, animistic spirit takes them over. They act like an animal. Uh -huh. uh, he says they're bad. And so I'm just saying, look, this is nothing to play around with. So oh, so <laughs> this is back in uh, 87 or 8. <clears throat> All of a sudden, this guy starts writing into the newspaper uh, condemning me. And then he was a werewolf. He was afraid some nut, some bigot like me was going to shoot him with a silver bullet. I never, I never heard of this before, right? <laughs> and uh, he's telling about how on a full moon night, he strips naked. He goes, what, you put this in the paper? Oh, my gosh. He goes down to the canyon, which is right off 651. And last time, he went out and, and ate a raccoon. Oh, my I, goodness. And, oh, something Better get it, some rabies it, shots. It was never, as it was a joke, in fact, went on all summer, the exchange between us. I I, consider, I took it as being someone crying for help or was a real uh -huh. thing. But uh, <clears throat> at the at the very end, finally the owner of the paper said, what do y'all got a vendetta against Joe? You got to stop this thing, man. <laughs> <laughs> People were closing their windows at night and all kinds of stuff. But anyway, so the last letter was never published, but he wrote it to the editor, thanking him for giving him a voice, letting him have a platform to talk about all this. And it was typed up. I saw the letters typed up on an IBM Selectric, this before, before computers. 
perfectly typed, no white out, like this person knew what they were doing, you know, like they were really, they were a writer or something. Uh -huh. it, 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 he never broke, and it's never since. No one's ever come by and said, yeah, we fooled old Joe, didn't we? No one's ever confessed to it. No one's ever said, yeah, I know that guy was all a big joke. No one's ever said that. So I just have to take it at face value. <laughs> anyway, if you see some guy running around naked out here in Crosby, don't know, 651, <laughs> that's who it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I absolutely believe that lycanthropy is a part of the historical tradition and that um, Satanists involved in you know conjuring devils and demons and involved in being possessed by fallen angels that that kind of stuff can happen to them um, but certainly there seems to be a black magic connection to this kind of capability and that historically um, the stories of individuals that undergo and have this kind of a transformation um you know again we don't know the relevance of it uh, but certainly stories like that there seems to be something behind them <clears throat> you know uh the, even like with the the ufos and bigfoot and giants and all of that all of these just really strange and supernatural and esoteric subjects that um, they've been forever embedded into the human conscience and to the historicity of humanity, uh, whether legends, myths, oral traditions, that these kind of things have, you know, been part of the fabric of reality for a very long time. And so I do believe there's something to them you know, um, even though we may not understand fully what that is. Well, that that's why I, I call my conference. They are real. We just go on. I'm saying this is not a joke. Just people aren't making these things up. But as a Christian, uh, to me, you, uh, a Christian, it, we're obligated to understand life. We understand how we're going to help people if we don't understand things. Right. If you don't know anything about demon possession or drugs or abuse, how can you help people? Because you don't recognize why they're acting the way they are. Right. So, you know, what if, uh, here, here's my last thing on Bigfoot. I, uh, I've made this statement before. I, I don't see how they can be human beings because in 500 years of the gospel being preached in America, in various places all over the country, and these things can come right up to a building, they can hear, they can listen. If, if they were, if, you know, the Bible says that he has, God has his people among every nation, kindred, tongue, and tribe. That includes everybody. So uh, why in 500 years has not one Bigfoot ever come forward and made a profession of faith in Christ? Uh, okay. Maybe one will. But in all this time, uh, it, so there again, uh, it, that would be human. Doesn't matter if he's covering hair. Don't care about that. But uh, now, now the the non christians going to go. Well, that's nonsense. They don't believe that stuff anyway. Okay, that's fine. But as a Christian, I've got to look at it that way. You know, can how do we define these things? Can they be shot like animals? Can we eat them like a hog? You know, are they are they <laughs> are they hybrids? Are they part people, part human? Yeah. Man. <clears throat> and there's other aspects. The, the um, Gigantopithecus is the giant ape of mostly in China. We don't know much about it. Is it possible that that uh, this is just that upright ape that's been around for all this time and didn't go extinct like they want you to believe? Maybe it's just that. And they have all these characteristics that are, I mean, you know, look at what some birds do. Uh, they do some pretty complicated weaving with their beaks and all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> Fish can build little pyramids out there in the in the ocean that are mathematically correct. So, could Bigfoot just be Gigantopithecus? And all these things are endemic to it. I don't know. Lots to consider. Jury yeah, jury is out for sure. Hey, brother, we've got um, just two minutes remaining, and so if you would, can you share final comment? Uh, yeah, anything 
as a parting word to the listening audience. Well, uh, keep an open mind. Don't be gullible. Don't believe everything you hear, but but take it in. Analyze it, like the Bible says, try all spirits, because all spirits are not of God. Uh-huh, right. And, uh, don't be narrow-minded. Well, I mean, you know, some people are not narrow-minded. They're just lazy. They don't want to right. be challenged or do anything challenging. They don't want to be... So I don't mess with them. If someone just, oh, I can't talk about that stuff. Okay, let's don't. Let's talk about the weather. <laughs> but right. the reason I appreciate guys like you, a lot of my flat earth friends, a lot of my uh, alien friends and UFO friends and people I'm not supposed to hang out with, <laughs> the reason I appreciate a lot of you guys because you're looking, you're searching. Right. You're willing to ask hard questions and try to come up with answers. I really appreciate that, you know. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do. My yes. perspective is as a Christian, and I'm going to try to influence people in that direction. But that doesn't mean everybody else doesn't know some truth, you know. Right. Uh, we're supposed to get knowledge. You get knowledge just about anywhere. We, sh- we get knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And I don't know. I'm just fascinated by these things. But I think we should know what they are. Because if they're demonic, if they're fallen angels, if they're going to have an influence on us, we need to know what they are, and how to combat it if it's evil. Right. Yeah, because I think, uh, you know, some of this is connected to uh, the coming reign of the Antichrist, too, and certainly that the whole push that the extraterrestrials created us, I believe, is connected to strong delusion, and uh, that is certainly on the forefront of human conscience right now. Yeah, it is, and uh, I'm not going to bring up another subject, but there's another subject connected to that. I think uh, Daniel speaks of, and I think that's where we are. So maybe some other time. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, brother, we appreciate you. Thanks for joining us.